So we're in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 15. And I've just been anticipating, excited to preach behind the pulpit. <laughs> get, get behind the pulpit and preach. All right, here we go, Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 15. And I'm going to begin reading here in just a moment out of verse number 20 and following. So you know where to get to. I want to set the story up. This is a story that Jesus is telling of a prodigal son. Here's what happened. The prodigal son came to a place in his life where he was bored. Any of you ever get bored of life and situations? Anybody? Okay. Boredom's not always a bad thing as long as you do the right thing with it. All right? Uh, as for Brandon, you see what he does with bored. All right? With a board. That was a bad joke. Anyway, he, he took a board and he made a beautiful... All right? It all depends what you do with your boredom. Okay? Now, no doubt, he's not bored. He's got a lot going on in that... That was added to his, his uh, schedule and, and how grateful we are for that. Here's the thing, is I want you to know that boredom set in on this prodigal son. And he came to a place where he was so bored with a situation, he was kind of sick and tired of where he was. Now listen, this is really important. This is a backdrop all this story is told against. I don't want you to miss it. He was at a place where... As far as he was concerned, hear me out, his father was dead to him. He told his dad, Dad, as far as I'm concerned, you're dead to me. What those words mean, I am never planning to come back here ever again. I don't want to look at your face ever again. I'm done with you. As far as I'm concerned, you are dead. Therefore, give me the inheritance that you would give me if I stuck around and really honestly waited for you to die. Give me my inheritance that you would give me in your death because as far as I'm concerned, you're dead to me. Now, if you're child said that to you, chances are the last thing in the world you'd probably do is start dividing out the inheritance. You'd probably be looking at him and going, huh, tough luck, pal. Maybe you'll find your way somewhere down the line. It's not what the prodigal's father did. The prodigal's father, he took and he gave his son his inheritance. And his son flipped his nose and he walked off never to show his face there in that place again. His father is dead to him. Well, he went out and he lived a rowdy life. He lived it up. Man. I mean, whatever his heart chose to do, he had the money to do it. He paid for his friends. He bought them their drugs and their alcohol and their women. And he had, it, he had it going on. I mean, he had his party, and he had a lot of fun, and had a lot of friends. Until his resources ran out. Do you know when your resources run out, that's when you find out who your real friends are? Do you know that? You say, well, pastor, what are you talking about? Okay, now I'm not talking about your money resources, being in the house. I'm talking about when you start emotionally running out of you're running out of resources like you know you find yourself in a place where you're just not happy you got a lot of heartache a lot of pain a lot of hurt going on you notice people that call you their friends start distancing themselves from you that's when you really know who your friends are when your resources start running out when you're running out this man, he ran out of his resources. He didn't have anything. All the things that he was buying for his friends, the fun, the joy, the excitement, the thrills, all those things were gone, and now he had nothing to offer, and he lost his friends. And in the middle of it all, have you ever had one of those moments where when it rains, it pours? <laughs> when things are going bad, everything else breaks down on top of it? You ever have that happen? <laughs> oh, my goodness, it's like, Really? It's even like, and we have, we have talked about this as a family, when somebody dies, it seems like it comes in twos or threes. Somebody dies, and it seems like somebody else we know dies, and then somebody else dies. Like, really? I mean, like, when it rains, it pours. When problems happen, they happen. The first speeding ticket I got, at least the one I remember, well, it was the first one I got. I remember I had to go to my dad and explain to him I got a speeding ticket. I was scared to death. I thought he was going to kill me. I really did. I thought, I'm going to die. 
And if I don't die, he, I'm going to wish I had died because he's going to take my car away from me. He's going to do all these horrible things to me. And so I remember when I went to him, I was so scared. And I said, Dad, I said, I've got something to share with you. He said, what's going on? I said, I got a ticket. I got a speeding ticket. And like a loving father, he just looked at me and said, well, you're going to pay for it. I said, you know, when you speed... That can get you in trouble. You can get a ticket doing that. Well, you know why he was so gracious? Because he's had a few in his own life. Thank God he understood, right? He didn't kill me. <laughs> but a few days later, I got pulled over again and got another ticket. Now, the first ticket was hard. The second ticket was sudden death. In my th- I mean, the first time I thought I was going to die. Second ticket... You know, you can only push it so far, right? I thought, I am really in trouble now. Wasn't a speeding ticket. I was written up a citation for running a red light. But I didn't run a red light, but I got written up for running a red light. I didn't know how I was going to talk to my dad about it. I went to him, I said, Dad, when it rains, it pours. <laughs> he said, son, what in the world are you talking about? I said, Whoosh. And I whipped it out there. He's like, are you kidding? Dad, it's really, it's, it's not, the, I got a ticket and I shouldn't have got a ticket. I didn't do anything wrong. And so when I went to court, just to finish the story, when I went to court, I explained to the judge what happened and he told me he would have done the same thing and, it, and the ticket didn't stand. I was in a turning lane waiting and the light didn't change. I waited a whole nother cycle. It didn't change again. It's like, what is a man to do? So I waited till straight lane was open and the green light was there and I went over into straight lane, went under a green light and I got pulled over for running a red light. I think running a red light would have been turning on the, on the red light, right? But anyway, the, 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 the judge said, son, I would have done the same thing. I don't even know what that police officer was thinking. And so he minus that. But when it rains, it pours. And here the prodigal son, he, he was out of money, he was out of friends, and now... There's a drought in the land. And a drought in the land means that all good jobs have dried up. The crops are drying up. There's no rain. And so therefore the farmers didn't have any crops to to, to get. And and things were just terrible. There was a drought in the land. And so the prodigal son, here he didn't have any money. When you don't have any money, what do you need? You need a job. And he couldn't find a job. Finally, he took a job that there is no Jew on on earth that would want this job. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now that's amazing. Here's what I want to bring to your attention this morning. All right? I want to bring to your attention that while he was a great way off, this implies a few things I want to bring here, I want to bring to light. The father was full, you can mark this down, the father was full of anticipation. He anticipated the return of his son. He was watching, he was being sensitive, he is being aware that when his son was afar off. Now I've been caught up in the middle of things and be so busy with things. Have you ever been so busy with something you miss the obvious? How about not even being so busy? How about men just going to the refrigerator trying to find something? And it's like, all right, where'd it go? I can't find it. You tell your wife, I can't find this. It doesn't even have to be a refrigerator. You be looking for something and can't find it. And she says, it's right there. No, it's not. I just looked. It's not there. Open the door and look again. Oh, well, who put it there? There it is. I mean, it wasn't even behind anything. Am I the only one, or is there anyone else that would uh, say they've gone through that, all right? My wife gets on to me, it's called refrigerator blindness. She says, you have refrigerator blindness. You can't see what's right in front of you. That's because I'm looking for something. I'm thinking about something different. I'm thinking it's packaged differently than what it is. So I'm looking for something else, and what I'm looking for is actually right in front of me. 
We can be so uber focused in what's going on around us in life. Listen to me, if you miss what I'm saying, don't miss this. You miss what God's got coming. Because you're too busy and too consumed trying to balance everything that's going on in front of you. And there's nothing wrong. Believe me, the father kept his household running. It's not a matter of neglecting your responsibilities. It's just not being so caught up and uber-focused on your responsibilities that you don't have time for anticipation of what the Father has in front of you. The Father was with a heart of anticipation. And it tells us here that the Father, I believe He longed for His Son. Because the Scripture tells us That he was, when he was a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. Now that's pretty awesome. Because the father more than just had, he longed for a son. It was more than just, it was more than it just being nice that his son showed up. But he had a great affection by his return. He had an affection, a compassion by the return of his son. Now, let me paint that a little better for you. If somebody, if you had a child that went off to war and came back home and they walked through the door after being gone two, three years, I guarantee you without a shadow of doubt there's not a person here if you loved your son would have them walk in the door and go, oh, hey. Glad you're home. You wouldn't do that, would you? Matter of fact, if you are at home, shame on you. You should be at the airport when he flies in. And you would be. Because you would be so excited. You probably would anticipate his return so much, you'd probably make a a poster or something saying, Welcome home, son. I mean, you would go out of your way to make sure that he knew that you were excited about his return back home because you love him. There's a heart of anticipation that you would have. But can I say, we've got to get out of this place where when people come in the doors of our church, that we're not going, hey, good to see you here. Glad you're here this morning. What is that? You know what that is? It's a lack of anticipation on our part. If we're not anticipating, then when it happens, we just bump into the moment rather than anticipating with expectation something great. You know what the answer to that is? Hear me out. Don't miss this. If you miss anything I say today, this one part, do not miss this. The answer to that, the the solution to our heart just accepting people like, hey, glad you're here, and our heart of just wanting to love on them, is prayer, prayer, prayer. Prayer will create an anticipation. Prayer will incorporate in us a, a, a choice of participation when we see somebody we've been praying for. How important it is that we gender in our heart and in our spirit this heart of anticipation. The father was full of anticipation. The father longed for his son. And his his affection, his great affection for his son, what does it say happened? He was moved by his affection. What does it say that he did? He ran, he embraced, and he kissed his son. He ran, keep in mind, this young man was an adult, which now makes his father more of an adult. So he's an older man. I'm above 50, and for me to run, there has to be a real good reason. I just don't run like it used to. I just run because I could. Now I can't, so I have to run because I choose to run. You see what's happening? The father didn't run because it's just in his nature to get up and take off running. He ran because he chose to run. He ran because he had anticipation. He was excited because he had been waiting for this moment. And he ran to meet his son. And not only did he run to meet his son, but oh my goodness, 
every servant he had and every friend he had gasped when he fell on his neck. I smelt him coming down the road. He smelt like a pig's pen. The father didn't care less. I remember when my dad told me that there was a time he used to minister at the Evansville Rescue Mission and, and uh, even in California, the rescue mission out there, and I can't think of the name of Anaheim uh, Rescue Mission or something. That, and he said there have been many a times where he's knelt down with someone that was homeless, put his arm around me. He said there's this one man in particular, he had a suit on, and said the man pushed around this little baby carriage. And in the baby carriage was this doctor's bag. And he said the man was dressed in a suit, though it was dirty and nasty, he had on a tie. He said the guy came forward one night and said he wanted to get saved. And dad bent down and he put his arm around him to have prayer with him. And out of his hair ran roaches and one ran up dad's arm. Dad kept his arm around him and led that man to the Lord. Only to find out that that man was a doctor, a prominent doctor in California at one time. And because of alcohol, he lost everything. He lost his practice, he lost his family, he lost his house, he lost everything. And now he's pushing around a baby cart with a doctor's bag in it. That's why I have a real problem with alcohol in people's life. I've seen how much it destroys people's lives. We may think that we're immune, but we're no different than that doctor. We're just one horrible decision away from being in the exact same place, every one of us. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is that we're dealing with, what we're, whether it's drugs or alcohol or anything else. We cannot let anything cause us to come to this place where we find ourselves in a hopeless place, and that's where this prodigal son had found and here he was stinking like a pig's pen and yet his father was moved with such affection and compassion that he ran and he fell on the neck of his son and he kissed him now it's one thing to hug somebody that's nasty and smell like a pig's pen but have you ever kissed a toilet seat no you wouldn't do it on purpose i would hope (laughs) but that's pretty well what he did He took that which was unclean on every level. And what love and compassion the father had for his son. He didn't care what society thought about him in this moment. All he cared about was letting his son encounter the love of the father. He ran, he embraced him, he kissed him. What would that look like for us? Well, can I say this? When people come in on the parking lot, we ought to see them afar off. We ought to see them coming. We shouldn't just wait inside the building and think, well, as soon as they walk in the door, I'll, I'll let them know I'm glad they're here. So I'm chewing on my chewing gum, looking all cool. Glad you're here. We ought to be like the father that, with the anticipation. I mean... Oh, here they come. They're coming down Stringtown. They're coming down Mill Road. Come on. Yep, yep, they're, they're going to turn. I know they're going to turn in here. Oh, there they are. They turn in here. Here we go. I'm ready. I mean anticipation. You're ready to receive them. Don't run at them. You'll scare them. All right? I'm not saying you. <laughs> they'll be like, oh, and they'll pull one out and go. Just, But there ought to be this spirit that your spirit is like a a horse and a gate ready for the race, man. I mean, you, nobody's going to get between you and them. <laughs> I mean, you're rocking on, your, on the balls of your feet. You're off your heels. You're ready to go. You Boom, okay, it's my turn. I'm up. I'm on. Here I go. You go and you let them know, hey, you couldn't have picked a better day to be at Mill Road Baptist Church. This is the perfect day for you to be here, and I'm glad you're here. We are honored to have you here at Mill Road today. If there's anything I can do to help make this day better for you in any way I can, if I have the capability, let me know. 
Matter of fact, come on, I'd like to introduce you to some people. And, and you just walk up. Don't just greet them and let them go. Walk them up, bring them in the building, and introduce them to people. And your job's been done. Somebody else now got to get on the balls of their feet and be the one next to bring somebody in. And bring them in. Be excited. And that's what it's about. Embrace them. And again, don't go out and slap your arms around their neck. You'll scare them. All right? But may they feel the embrace of their acceptance at Mill Road, that we love them and care about them. I don't care how they smell, how they look. I don't care where they come from. That doesn't matter. They ought to feel the embrace. And you, everyone here, would you agree with me that that's what we ought to be doing? Okay, everybody agree with me on that, right? But where the line, where the line is drawn, where the rubber really meets the road is when we only accept people to the line that we feel comfortable. But what if it's somebody really that comes in, they, have the, they reek with alcohol? Are you still going to love them on in? Are you going to, or would you be one to be embarrassed that, oh man, i got to bring them in, i got to smell them the whole way in, I'm introducing them to people, and people that I know are going to think, Could, why did you bring them to me, you know? Are you going to say, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm gonna, I want them to encounter the love of Jesus. What if it's somebody uh, that, that, you, that they're, they're living in sin, immorality, whatever their sexual sins might be? Maybe they're homosexual, whatever it might be. Would you still, regardless, show them the embrace of Jesus? And love them in? We should. You say, well, pastor, they need to know. Look, leave that up to God in His Word. Let the preaching of the Word begin to affect their heart. Because God will do that. The Spirit of God is way more powerful than you ever could be. So don't get in the way of the Spirit, the Spirit of God. Your job is to love them and to encourage them and to embrace them emotionally and let them know that this is a place that they can be and this is an awesome place and we're glad they're here and when they come in look if the conviction of the word of god deals with their heart things will change in their life and if it doesn't they may get ticked and put off by the preaching of the word and they may end up going somewhere else anyway but at the end of the day you shouldn't be the reason that they leave they should be offended by the preaching of the cross and there will be those that will be. But that should be what offends them, not us. We need to love them and care about them and let them know that we're glad they're here. And that kiss is just simply a, you shouldn't be kissing them. <laughs> but they should feel that kiss of God's love, that kiss of, that can come from God and God alone, a, an unconditional love that only God's people can give. They ought to encounter that the minute they come onto this property. And by the way, I believe that that does happen to some degree. I just don't think collectively we do that as well as we should. And I think that can change. Now, I want to give you, I talked to you about the father. Now I want to talk to you about the son for just a minute. Because here's what it says about the son. In verse number 21 it says, And the son said to him, the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, here's what I want to bring to your attention this morning. The son had already prepared this big old speech and he was going to give his dad when he got home. And he was going to tell him, Dad, I know I'm not worthy to be called your son, but if you would just let me be your servant and blah, blah, blah. You can go back up into the verse and read his prepared speech he was going to give. He no more got out this line right here when he said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and, against, uh, and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Here's what was going on in the son's heart. Let me interpret what he was simply saying. He was saying, Father, I know I don't fit in. Everyone else is better than me. I'm not like these people. They have it all together. Do you know those are lines that I've heard people say when I say, hey, you ought to come to church. Oh, you don't understand. I don't fit in. Oh, you don't understand. I'm not like those people. They have it all together. Everyone else is better than me. 
Do you know that's how people feel about themselves? Do you know that? Now I'm going to throw you a curveball. You ready? All right, you're at bat. You got the bat all set and ready. And I've even fair warned you I'm going to throw you a curveball. You got to be ready for this. So my question would be this. What was the father's response? What was the father's response? You ready? Here we go. Look at it. It says in verse number 22, But the father said to his servant, I'm sorry, the servant wasn't talking to him. The son was talking to him. (laughs) His conversation went from his son to his servant. He wasn't even going to address his son's concerns. What's being said here? It says, And he said, the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put put it on him and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Here's what was going on right here. Simply the father's response was, He didn't try to convince his son to think differently. He didn't respond to what he was saying. Listen to me. I think too many times we try to answer everybody's questions. Oh, I'm not as good as them. And what do we do? We, we belittle ourselves. We belittle everybody at the church. Oh, yeah, you know, we're not any better than you and blah, blah, blah. We don't even have to go there. That's where they see themselves. And it doesn't matter how much you try to convince them that they are no worse than the rest of us. They are convinced in their mind and your words are never going to change that if that's the way they think and feel. you ever got an argument with somebody about something and they were headstrong on whatever, how they felt? And no matter how many words you said, you weren't going to change their mind. Have you ever had that? Come on now. Okay? Probably everyone in this room's dealt with that. I have learned that when somebody is strong-headed about something, I don't have to try to convince them differently. I'm not going to be able to. I can look at them and go, I completely understand that's how you feel. And I, and I respect that. I may not feel the same way, and this is, this is what I believe is the way this work, the way it is, but at the end of the day, I, I know that I'm not here to try to change your mind. Doesn't do you any good to try to argue with a brick wall. If somebody's convinced... Now, listen to me for a minute. I've had people come to Mill Road Baptist Church who sat in the congregation who said that they felt like everybody stared them down the whole service. Now, I don't know how you do that unless you get eyes in the back of your head. Because they sat in the back. (laughs) And I'm thinking, how did that happen? Because I was looking at the yokes of your eyes when I was preaching. So I know better what happened. But you couldn't convince them any differently because they chose to believe in their mind that everybody that life was centered around their head and that everything that happened in this auditorium was somehow centered around them and they thought it was about them. It wasn't true. But that was truth to them. And their perception, that's what they felt. I had one person tell me one time, said, Pastor, people are holding my past against me. And I, after I picked myself up off the floor, I said, I'm the only one who knows your past. <laughs> Nobody in here, I don't even know that they know your name. How are they holding their, your past against you? They don't even know who you are. <laughs> How can that be? you got these voices going on in your head trying to tell you stuff that isn't so. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to convince them any different. Here's what the father did. He didn't try to convince his son any differently. He did not try to respond to that. But what did he do? He turned and he said to the servant, Look, it's time to implement the plan. It's time to do what I have anticipated happening. I have prepared for this. I have prayed for this. And now it's time to put the plan to action. I'm not here to address your arguments or your, or your insecurities. I'm just here to let the love of Jesus be all over you. And that's all he did. He said to the servant, go and get. What did he say? Bring quickly. He didn't say take your time. He didn't say go fumble around. He said go bring quickly the best robe. Now I love that. 
What I want you to know is he didn't respond. In other words, it was not about winning a debate or an argument. It wasn't about making a point. If you don't learn anything out of the Kellogg's mouth, you'll probably hear this more than you hear anything else. As we often say, don't make a point, make a difference. If what you're about ready to say isn't going to make a difference, then just shut up. What's the point? In marriage counseling, I tell people, why are you always trying to make a point in your marriage? Points are left for the ball field. They're left for the basketball court. You're there to score points. But in a relationship, we're not about scoring points. It's about making a difference. And so, sure, the father could have made a point with his words, but he didn't. All he wanted to do was make a difference. And what does it say that he did? Look at it here. Boy, i got to move. Here's what he said. The father simply implemented his welcome home plan. Here's what happened. I'm going to fly through these really quick. There's there's a few things that he provided. I'm going to give you three P's that he gave. But first of all, he said, quickly, go and get the best robe. Not just any robe. Don't just go find a robe. You go and get the best robe. Hear me out for a minute. Jesus Christ robes us in the robes of righteousness. Isn't that awesome? It's a robe of righteousness. What does that mean? It means right standing with God. He puts a robe of right standing around each and every one of us, not because of who we are, but despite who we are. He puts a robe of right standing around us. Isn't that awesome? Doesn't matter that we stink like a pig's pen. It doesn't matter what everybody else thinks about us. God puts a robe of right standing around us. And you know what? A lot of people are clothed in their own self-righteousness. And the Bible says our self-righteousness is nothing but like filthy rags to the eyes of God. In other words, it's like pulling out all the robe, all all what would be the best of our robes, out of the pig's trough and putting it on, going, look at me. I'm special. I'm important. Look how hard I've worked to be where I'm at today. Look, you can find people like that in churches. I thank God we really don't have anything really like big out there where people like that. But there are people like that in churches who believe because they've gone to church in a particular church longer than anybody else that their voice is more important than anyone else's. Or because they got more money to give than someone else that somehow they've got more voice or influence uh, in the church. That's not true. Every person who comes to church, we're on an equal playing ground. We're on God's level. The foot of the cross. It's a robe of right standing because of God, not because of us. Not because of what we got, but because of what we've received from Jesus. This robe of righteousness. Go and get the robe. Why do I say that? Because when somebody walks onto the property, when somebody slides their feet out of their car to put their feet on this property, they ought to sense that we are clothing them in right standing. You belong here. This is where you belong. We want you here. The next one there, he says, not only quickly you'll get the robe, but put it on him, but he says, put a ring on his finger. Now, this more than just any ring, this is the best ring. This is the most valuable ring. In the King James, it says a gold ring. It's not a silver ring. It's not some ring out of the bubblegum machine. I mean, a gold ring is the best ring. He went and got the best of what he had. What is that? All right, the first one, the the best robe, was possession. It is a possession given us by God. A a, a robe of right standing with God. That's the possession. The next one is the most valuable ring, is a position. It's a place of importance. This is his son. And he's giving him... The best ring, the most valuable ring. It's a, it is truly a place of position. There's nobody in this church that's better than anyone else, including the preacher. 
We're just a bunch of beggars pointing other beggars where the bread's at. That's it. That's what we're doing. That's who we are. None of us deserve to be here, but God, by His grace, gives us that availability. And then the third thing, look at it there. He says, and shoes on His feet. So I've given you two P words so far, possession and position. And now the third one is this. I can't help but think of Ephesians. Chapter 6, verse number 15, it says, And my feet shod, sorry, I've memorized it in King James, don't know any other word to use. My feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shoes represent peace. A safe place. On my bus, one of my prayers, I try to pray this every day, that God would make my bus a a safe and peaceful place for these young people. They may not have it anywhere else in their life, but my prayer is God let them have it on this bus. May they encounter a peace that passes all understanding right here. And then use that somehow in their adult life for them to reflect back and go, oh yeah, I remember we had a preacher on our bus. Maybe that has something to do with how things just felt so right on that bus that maybe they say, you know what? When you're in the presence of God, there's just something about that. I'm not God, but God lives in me. And where the presence of God is, people ought to encounter Him. But it's a place of peace. The good news of peace. Then the fatted calf. It goes on to say in that next verse, look at it. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. And was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So what happened? The fatted calf. The fatted calf was a provision. If you want to write down another P word, it's a provision. And then the other part is be merry. Be happy, celebrate. That is the party, if you want to put another P, the party. Not a time of mourning and sadness, but of joy and celebration. When a person comes through the doors of the church, they may have the weight of the world on their shoulders, and they may walk in with a long face, and they're sad. Don't go up to them and go, Oh, man, I'm sorry you're not feeling good. I hope you... Don't get with them. Get out of the pig pen celebrate, be joyful. This, you couldn't have picked a better Sunday than this Sunday to be at Mill Road Baptist Church. I am so glad you're here. You might say, well, Pastor, what about the next Sunday? Exactly the same thing. Hey, you couldn't have picked a better Sunday to come back to Mill Road Baptist Church. Every Sunday ought to be an exciting day when people come back home. And not just people that have never been here, but one another. We ought to be excited. We should never take for granted that the Harrisons come to church every Sunday or that the Martins or the McGars or anyone else that's in this auditorium should never take that for granted. All it takes is a choice, a decision to not be here. We should never take each other for granted. We all say, man, I am so glad you're here today. I have longed, I have looked for, I have anticipated, I have prayed about connecting with you this week. And here we are. (laughs) Yes, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for coming. We need to love each other on that level. Now his older brother was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. Now I understand hearing music, but hearing dancing, boy, you got to really be dancing to be heard. Now, of course, Jewish custom, you know, so I don't know what that looked like, but they're beating the floor, man. They had it going on. They had a party going on, and the sun was put out. And he said, you never did this for me. Sure, I get it. There's some of you. You've been going to church for a long time. You never had a party thrown for you. You've never been uh, well overdue for showing up and all that kind of thing. You've just been faithful. 
don't let the spirit of jealousy swell up in your heart when we love on those who haven't been here. They need to be here. We just need to be thankful that God has us where, we're, where we need to be and where we're supposed to be. But there's others who need to be here too. Will you do me a favor? Just turn and look in the auditorium for a moment. Turn, turn around and just look. Take a look. See what we got, please. Just turn and look. I know you're looking at people and people in the back are embarrassed now, but I'm not talking about the people. I want you to look at the provision God has made for us. All these seats. What are we doing with them? You know, one day God's going to look at us. He's going to say, you know, just like Moses. I said, what's that in your hand, Moses? God's put something in our hand. It's pretty good size. And when we're not using it for what God's given us the capability of doing, we'll stay in account for that one day. We need to do everything we can to fill up these pews, to bring people in here. Why? Not because we want to just simply fill up the pews. We need to have the heart of the prodigal's father. That's why I said, wow, be a PF. Be a prodigal's father. Be a prodigal's father. Anticipate their coming. Pray for their coming. And when they come, I mean, don't let anything hold you back from going and letting them know how glad you are they're here and love on them and care for them. And why wow? Because everything the father did was a wow factor. He even took the fatted calf. That's the yearling. That's the young cow that you just don't kill for any reason because that meat is tender and it's the best meat you're going to have. It's not aged and gotten hard or chewy. It's fresh. And he did, he took the very best of what he had and he laid it out there for the one that returned. You know, I realize sometimes we can be so poor there's not anything else we can do but to buy the generic of everything. I get that. But I think when it comes down to loving on people when they come in, we have the best donuts, we have the best coffee, we have the best, we ought to, I mean, they ought to be wild when they come in. We ought to have such a wow that people who are typical go to church or kind of people go, yeah, I don't see the point in all that. Well, that's because you don't understand. Let me put it in perspective. May I? The last verse, I want you to look at it with me. It's simply verse number 32. Look at it. It says, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad. Why was it fitting? To celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Here's the point. When somebody comes onto the property of Milro Baptist Church, this represents as best they know, it represents Jesus. And they are trying to draw back to Jesus. And this represents Jesus. And when somebody comes, that means the lost has been found. They were dead, but now they're coming alive again. We ought to celebrate that with them. We ought to be excited about that. Can you be excited about that? We need to have a joy unspeakable and full of glory when people are drawing back to Jesus. Not just to talk to you later. (laughs) No, talk to you later, don't get it. Don't get it we got to talk to them now. Every head bowed and every eye closed. 